Okay. One five. So how do we deal with this problem of we know what the word singular means. It acts like a zero, so we better not be multiplying by it. It doesn't have an inverse, right? We can't undo it. If I do it, I can't undo it. If it's non-singular, doesn't act like a zero, I can go ahead and multiply by it because it can be undone. It has a multiplicative inverse, so those are safe. Why? Where does this come from, and why do we have these terms, and what's really going on? The idea of this begins with the study of trying to figure out matrices that does the exact same thing as Gaussian elimination and Gauss-Jordan elimination. In other words, if we would have that a system of equations and can be represented as a matrix form of AX equals B, right? where A is your coefficient matrix, X is your variables that I'm looking for, and B is the thing on the other side. And so we should be able to go back and forth between matrices, representations, and systems of equations. Now, if we took our systems of equations and left them as a system of equations, and we did Gauss-Jordan, you would end up with something that would end up with this idea of X1 is equal to some sort of constant, say, answer 1 x2 is a constant, say, answer 2, and then we get xn is equal to a constant, answer n, which is really, when I would look at it, if this was an augmented matrix, it would be 1's down the diagonal, and then over here is answer 1, answer 2, up to answer n. In other words, we did row operations until I did the Gaussian elimination is put 1's on the diagonal, 0's down below, use those 1's to make 0's up above, and the right-hand side's your answer. And we did row ops, right? Gauss-Jordan is just simply row operations. Now, there should be a tie so that I could multiply this by a matrix of some sort and it does the exact same thing until finally can we do matrix algebra so that we eventually get down to a problem where the answer is x is equal to say the same things, uh, answer one, answer two, up to answer n. And so what is matrix algebra? Matrix algebra is can you do things like multiply by a non-singular matrix, because if you multiply by singular matrices, that's bad, it destroys things, right? Can I multiply by non-singular matrices? Could I add subtract matrices? It'll end up that you don't have to, right? What are the matrix ops I can do that a matrix applied to a matrix is allowed to happen until finally that shows up. I have my answer. Everything's gone. The A is completely gone. And I'm left with a vector on the right-hand side. It's really easy to read my answer. So we're going to tie each of those row ops into a matrix that I'm allowed to use that does exactly what that row op does. And those matrices are going to be called elementary matrices. So we will find matrices, and these are going to be called E type 1, E type 2, E type 3. And the book will sometimes use 1, 2, 3, but that's bad because they use 1, 2, 3 for other reasons as well. Sometimes it's like this is a sub-index, that's the purpose of I chose to do this at this particular time and it doesn't have anything to do with the type. So I'm very specific. I write, if I'm talking about a type of matrix, I write type. If I write a sub-index like 1, 2, and 3, it's an event. You chose to multiply this by a matrix, it happens to be the first time you did it. E1. I do it again, E2. Do it again, E3. Do it again, E4, E5, up to E1 million. However many times, however many ops are necessary, we're just going to write those down and tell me which op in order you did. Each of these types is going to be related to, so E type 1 is going to be based on, on row ops. And so E type 1 is going to be a row swap. E type 2 is going to be 
a row times a scalar. And E type 3 is going to be a row plus some multiple of a row. And we'll replace row. And so that's, that, was our major, that was our row operations. I could say, hey, let's take row 1 and row 5 and turn them around. Let's take row 6 and multiply it by 1 third. And that's row 6. And the other one will be, hey, I'm going to take row 7 and add it to 10 row 2s, and that's my new row 7. Or if we did normal operations, is I take row 1 multiplied by negative 5, add it to row 2 to get that negative, that 1 to be a 0, that 5 to be a 0 as I did it, right? That's the whole point of, of Gaussian elimination. And we're going to go through all of these, and we also know the following properties. So that's what we're going to get to. We'll find these. These are going to be called elementary matrices. Because I do the elementary row operations. And the next thing is we're going to use the fact that I know that if AX equals B has a solution, then for M non-singular, it's not acting like a singularity, it's not acting like a zero. M AX equal to M B is equivalent. In other words, it has the exact same solutions. So you're always able to multiply by any non-singular matrix and you're not going to change the solutions to your system. But we're going to pick these three. And so what we're going to need to do is find matrices that do exactly what the row ops do and show that they're non-singular. Because if they're singular, I can't use them. I need non-singular things. All right, type one. This is our row swap. So example, if I would had two, one, three, one, negative one, zero, four, two, one, a lot of times when I would do Gaussian elimination, you would just do what? Swap one and two. Swap one and two. So I would have one, negative one, zero, two, one, three, four, two, one. Just pretty straightforward. And we would just simply take those two and swap them. All right, it ends up being that E type one is simply equal to the matrix. It's literally gonna be I, except we're going to swap row I and row J. And then what happens is E type 1 times a matrix is going to be M with row I, row J swapped. Let's go back to our problem. So my matrix was this. It was 2, 1, 3, 1, negative 1, 0, 4, 2, 1. So that's my matrix. And I want to swap row 1 and row 2. So I'm going to take matrix I, which is ones on the diagonal. What would I look like if I took row 1 and 2 and turned them around? I took I and just turned around rows 1 and 2. Let's multiply it. What do I get? 1, negative 1, 0. 2, 1, 3, 4, 2, 1. Done. Note, if you put the elementary matrix on the right, it's a column operator. In other words, if I look at this, this would look like column 1 and column 2 have been swapped. So if I put it on the right, it will swap column 1, column 2. So a left-hand multiply is a row op. A right-hand multiply is a column op. We'll use that later, and I'll restate that. But you can do it if, I mean, just a little fact. OK, now comes the next question. Does E type 1 inverse 
exist. All right, what am I looking for? I'm looking for a matrix that when I apply to my matrix gives me back what? The identity, right? When I apply it to inverse, I get the identity, right? Okay, what does my matrix do? It swaps I and J. What do I want to do to go back? Swap I and J. So what do you think would happen if I applied it to itself? If I say swap I and J, and then apply it right to itself, it would swap, swap I, I and J back, and then be back to the identity. So it ends up being that the answer is yes, because E type 1 times E type 1 is simply the identity. Swap, swap again. And so it ends up it's self inverting. So that's rather nice. So E type 1's inverse is itself. So what's the inverse of that matrix? Itself. Just multiply it by itself and you get back I. That's nice. And then, so there's nothing to do. It's like, hey, I, not only do I have the inverse, it's easy for me to find. It's itself. I don't have to do anything. All right, that's great. That means what? If I was solving a system of equations, and I need to find an equivalent system, and I go through my row ops, and I notice that the very first thing you did was switch rows two and three, I would say, oh, I'm going to take rows two and three of I and multiply by that matrix on the left, multiply that new matrix on the right, and I have done the exact same thing. And why is it safe to do it? Because it has an inverse. I can undo what I just did. All right, so that's type one. I at least can do row swaps. All right, what about type two? Type two is I would like to have a scalar times a row to equal that exact same row. Okay, um, E type 2, V is going to be I, but all you have to do is put alpha in the delta II position. <coughs> all right, um, let's go back to our example. So we had this row right. Let's say we got to, you had 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 2, 4, and 0, 3, 7. And I want to make this an I. Sorry, make this a 1. What would be your row up? I would multiply row 2 by what? 1 half. What matrix would do that? You would just simply take the identity matrix and in the position of the row you're working on, don't put a 1, put the thing you want to multiply by. I would like to multiply that by a half, and everybody else is unchanged. If I do that, and I go ahead and multiply, this would be 1, negative 1, 0. This would be 0. One, two, and then zero, three, three. It did what I wanted to do. So in your head, we now now this is kind of important. You have to think, what would be the row op I would do? So guess what? You need to be good at row operators. Remember how I said that we need to know these things? Now not only do you need to know how to do the row op, you're then gonna write a matrix that does exactly the same thing. So we have to memorize or understand what matrix would do this, and then we just write it down. Hey, this is the row up I do. Okay, this is the matrix that represents it. Yes? Should the last three be a seven? That's supposed to be. Well, yeah. Wow, my sevens are so sloppy, they start to look like threes over time. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> okay, now comes the question of 
does E type 2 inverse exist? All right, now let's just look at this problem. I multiplied row 2 by a half, and I got row 2 to be 1, sorry, 0, 1, 2. If I said, please undo that, how would you undo that? Two. You'd multiply it by 2. How'd you know it was 2? It's the scalar inverse of whatever I multiplied by. So if I multiply by a half, I have to multiply by 1 over a half, which happens to be what? 2. If I multiply by 10, I would have to multiply by 1 tenth, because that would undo it. Yay. It's actually rather nice. And the answer is yes. E type 2 inverse is 1 over alpha in the delta ii position. So instead of like you, you had alpha, take 1 over alpha. Let's undo what you multiplied by, because that's the scalar inverse, scalar multiplicative inverse. We're taking advantage of college algebra. All right, let's take a pause for a second. Um, any matrix that looks like that is a type 2, right, which is a row multiplier elementary operation, elementary matrix. What do I notice it instead of if I put instead of putting a half there, if I put a 2 there to undo what I just did, that's still type 2. So the inverse of a type 2 is a type 2. And what's the inverse of a type 1? It's the exact same type 1. So it's actually not making a new matrix. So how do I mess with type 2s? I use type 2s. I just have to go ahead. I multiply by 5, multiply by a fifth. If I multiply by negative 1 seventh, I multiply by negative 7. Right? It's just the reciprocal in the same position. So type 2s inverses are still type 2. So I'm not making anything new. I'm staying within our same elementary matrices. OK. The last thing we have to do would be, I wonder how complicated it's going to be if I would like to have row 4 adding a negative 1 7th of row 5 to make a new row 4. Like how do we do something like that? So type 3 would be I want row i plus some multiple of row j to get a new row i. It ends up being that it's really easy. Type 3 is just simply i and then you simply do is you put m in the a i j spot. So you want to take, so let's go back to our question. So for example, I want to have uh, my matrix 1, uh, 4, 2, 0, 1, 3, 0, negative 2 thirds, 7. And my row op is, when I look at this, I would like to make him a 0. So how do I do that? I want to take my row 3 and add what? 2 thirds of row 2 to get a new row 3. Is everybody okay with that? And so what do I do? What matrix will do this? The matrix that does this is the identity matrix, but one's down the diagonal, except in the ij spot. Right? This is where this is important that you write it this way. In the what spot? 3, 2. In the 3, 2 spot, what number do I plug in? 2 thirds. Where is the 3, 2 spot? Okay. 
If you don't want to memorize that, the easy, when you're doing Gaussian elimination like this, where does the number go? What are you getting rid of? <laughs> are you getting rid of this spot right here? That's where you put the number. And when I do this multiplication, let's check. What is it going to be? It's going to be 1, 0, 0 times all that, so that's 1, 4, 2. 0, 1, 0 times all of that, so that's going to be 0, 1, 3. But what's going to happen to the third row? It's going to do 0, 2 thirds of row 2, plus 1 of row 3, still 0. 0, 2 thirds of row 2, negative 2 thirds times 1, right? 1 of row 3 gives me 0. Then 0, what's 2 thirds and 3? 2. 2. And seven. seven, so the answer is Is everybody okay with that? How would I undo this? If I had a row and then I added a multiple of another row. So I had row one and I added five row twos. I'm like, I didn't want you to add five row two. What would you do? I would subtract five row twos. Well, that's a rather e easy inverse to do. <laughs> so instead of having M in that spot, I would plug in minus M in that spot. And it ends up being that. So does E type three inverse exist? And the answer is uh, going to be yes. E type 3's inverse is going to be simply put minus m in the AIJ position of the identity matrix. All right, so what's the inverse of that matrix? The exact same matrix, except instead of two thirds, it's negative two thirds. Is everybody okay with that? What is the inverse of this matrix? Two instead of a half. What's the inverse of this matrix? Itself. So it ends up being that and we would go through all of those, it ends up being that the inverse of every elementary matrix is an elementary matrix of the exact same type, just a small variation. No variation for type one. Type two, you had a five there, put a one fifth there. What's type three? You had a seven there, plug in a negative seven there because it's a additive inverse that we're gonna be using. We just subtract to make it zero, undo that addition. Okay. We have a nice theorem. If E is elementary, then E is non-singular, which means its inverse exists, and its inverse is of same type. Now, it's important for us to understand you should be able to verbalize the row op that you would do, write the matrix that does it, and state immediately what would be the inverse of this particular matrix? And we'll stay Y here in a little bit. But we should be able to go through any particular problem. Let's say I started off with a matrix. Let's say one, and I'll start off with a two. So two's one, zero, one, one, three, four, one, negative one, zero. And let's say I want to swap row three 
in row one? How would you do that? What matrix would do that? Identity. We take the identity and I'm going to swap. Then you swap the row identity. Which would mean this would be 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Whoops. 1, 0, 0. 1, 0, 0. It would do that. All right, on the other hand, what if I would end up being with a 7, 1, 3rd, 4, 2, 1, 6, and say 5, negative 1, 3. And let's say that for some particular reason, I want to take, oops, forgot the one thing that I was also wanting to say. Sorry. Take this down for a second. So this would be equal to E type 1. And by the way, what would E type 1, what would be the inverse of it? Itself. To undo it. Okay. What if I wanted to take row 3 and multiply it by, say, 1 fifth? How would I do that? How would I multiply row three by one fifth? Place one fifth for the one in the third. It's like which row are you working on? Go to that row, put a fifth. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. You want to put a one there for some oddball reason, right? But there's a purpose behind you in your head, and like, how would I do this? And that's the matrix that would do it. Okay, and what would be E type 3 inverse would be what? 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0, 0, 0, 5. Where's my 2? Oh, yeah. I'm all confused. Thank you. Is everybody okay? Thank you for getting my notation. Okay. Um, next one. Let's do a type 3 then. Let's say that we had... Say... Say... What do you want to do here? Say 5, 1, 2... Two, zero, one, and three, one third, four is the matrix that I have. And my goal is to make that a one. And I want to use a type three op. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say row one, and then I'm going to add a negative two, row two, to get a new row one. So I still have my five, one, two, two, zero, one. 3, 1, third, 4. What I want to do is take 5 and subtract 4 to make it a 1. So I want to use, let's say just to make my life easy, I want to only use type 3 ops. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to multiply fractions. I don't want to, it's like there's enough fractions in this. I want to stay with integers. So I'm going to try to do type 3 as much as possible. All right, I don't want to do row swaps. I want to use hopefully something special. All right, that would make that into a 1 in that spot. But what matrix does exactly that? You have the identity, except I'm going to put what number in what spot? Negative two where? Does it do it? You could do a quick check. Five. Go across and down, right? 5 minus 4, 0 is 1. That's what I wanted to have happen. It's taking row 1 with that 1 and negative 2 of that, and it goes across. 
Is everybody okay with that? All right. What would be its inverse? So if that is type 3, let's get this right. <laughs> so E type 3's inverse would be what? 1 inverse 2 zero. Same thing, just put a 2 in there because I want to add it back. So I subtracted 2, I want to add 2, and now it didn't do anything, and we're back to the original. Is everybody okay? All right. So when we do Gauss-Jordan, if we have our system of equations, and we, if we choose to put it in an augmented matrix just to keep things in order and make it look clean, it really doesn't matter, right? As a system is A, X is equal to B. And as you go through your system of equations, and if you do it in augmented matrix form or not, you, you could leave it in long version of it and leave all the X's and Y's and Z's, but what you do is you go through here and you would have, for example, step one is you would say, I've done a row op for a very specific purpose. The, what's the Gauss purpose? Put a one, in your lead variable position, and then zeros down below it. Well, how do I do that? I do row swaps. I multiply by non-zero constants, and then I take a row plus a multiple of another row until I get zeros right. That's We do type one, type two, or type three operators. And so we go through this Gaussian until we get ones down the diagonal, zeros below, and it's in row echelon form. Gauss-Jordan is take those, put zeros up above, which is still type 1, type 2, type 3 row ops until I get 1's down the diagonal and the answer's on the other side. So this row op will have associated with it some sort of elementary matrix that does exactly that. And then we do step 2 with purpose, right? we do this whole Gauss-Jordan thing. We have a goal, but what is this? This is some sort of row op, which is either type 1, 2, type 2. I don't know what, you, what it is. It's what did you do. But that actually is some elementary matrix that you've done uh, to the thing that you just had. Is everybody okay with that? And we keep on going. Hopefully we do all this work and we have this kind of end goal where we had the identity ma matrix and the answer on that side. But what should happen? That means I've done a bunch of elementary ops, every one of which you would apply to both sides why is it I can apply them to both sides of the equation? Because they're non-singular. It has the exact same solution set. And what happens? If I keep doing this, this thing will only have an answer if all of that becomes what? I. If this becomes I, then it's just simply X, and your answer is the thing on the other side. So all we have to do is keep track of, all right, what would you do? Write it as a matrix. What'd you do? There's another matrix. So can you see this might get ugly? But it's just a bunch of matrix multiplication. Every one of these is an elementary operator. And we'll have some terms. If you have a matrix B that is made up of, say, an elementary and another elementary and then another elementary times A. In other words, if you do a bunch of elementary, elementary matrices and you get a matrix, which obviously it will, right, you would say that A and B are somehow related. Because what's happening? I'm taking A and doing row ops. I did row swaps. I multiplied by non-zero constants. I took one row times another row. In other words, B is a bunch of row ops applied to A. If that's true, we're going to call them row equivalent. Call AB 
rho equivalent. One of the nice things about rho equivalencies is that they're commutative and they're transitive. Which makes sense is if, if I apply another elementary matrix, it's just another row equivalent thing. <laughs> apply another one, it's another row equivalent thing. In other words, if you could show that I can get from A to B and I can get from B to C, obviously I could have gotten from A to C. And commutativity is if A can go to B, B could go to A. Well, how do I know that? Well, can this matrix go on to the other side? Yes, it's invertible. And once it goes to the other side, could this matrix go to the other side? Yes, because it's invertible. In other words, row equivalency works both ways just by simply taking the matrices and write them on the other side, but you write their inverse on the other side in the opposite order. They go left to right on one side, they'll go right to left on the other because they have to unwrap right, to keep doing that. So row equivalency is both commutative and transitive. Now, we have the following theorem. Since solving a system, when we look at this, ends up being apply a bunch of invertible elementary matrices until if I would look at my old systems, I can solve by Gauss-Jordan elimination if there were no free variables, when I did all of my work, my coefficient matrix was ended up being square, right? And it's exactly the identity matrix. Which would tell us that if I apply a bunch, if it ends up that if you keep applying row ops until the identity shows up, that means this thing has to have an answer, which would mean that A and the identity are row equivalent. So the following theorem is this. A is n by n, so we're only going to talk about square things. Then the following are logically the same. So it's logically equivalent. The first is A inverse exists. In other words, A is what? It's another word for having the inverse exist. It turns to in terms of singularity. It's non-singular. Non the second is that AX equaling the double bar O is the zero vector. Has only the trivial solution. In other words, the homogeneous system has only the trivial solution. There are a, a is not a bad matrix. It can't make zeros. The only thing that will make zeros is to have all zeros in the x position. And the third possibility is that A is rho equivalent to I. What does that mean in terms of Gauss-Jordan? That means when you did your Gauss-Jordan stuff, the identity showed up, your answer's on the other side. And obviously, if you keep track of the stuff you did as matrices, they're just going to be there tagging along, representing what you did. Okay. What does that give us? first thing that it's going to give us is that we can actually find A inverse. Since going back to our problem, it says that if I do all row operations until the identity shows up, the thing on the right hand side is your solution, it would look like when we look at this as a system, we could look at the following. 
So if I would have my system equals B. And then if I would apply, well, what do you want to do first? I'm going to swap rows, whatever. And then we keep on going until what do you do last? So you keep doing these operators until finally what shows up on the other side is the identity. But if that's true, by the associative property, if this is the identity, that would tell us that A inverse has to be whatever multiplied A to make the identity which is all of those put together is the inverse. If those times A are the identity, they have to be the inverse. Because what is the inverse? Something times A gives you the identity. In terms of Gauss-Jordan though, is these all put together is these are the Gauss-Jordan steps. So if, you, if you're not interested in the matrices themselves, you just simply are, it's like, wait a second. That tells me that the Gauss-Jordan steps themselves put together form the identity. That means we have a, a technique to find A. So let's just use Gauss-Jordan and we would have Let's go ahead and take matrix A, augment it with the identity, which really means what? Take matrix A and the identity, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do all of the row ops on A. So we're just going to go through here and just simply do all the row ops on A until the identity shows up. What are those? That's going to end up being EK e k minus 1 down to e 2 e 1, right? But if I apply them on this side and I apply them on this side at the exact same time, if I apply them to a, it'll become the identity. But if I apply them to i, it'll be just the product of themselves. And the product of themselves is the inverse. So that's what's nice about augmented matrices. Augmented matrices say whatever you do to the left, do to the right. They're not mixing each other. It's just whatever you're doing to the left, you're doing to the right. Well, what am I working on? The identity. So what's left? All the stuff you did. Oh, wait, all the stuff I did ends up being inverse. Yay, nice, nice, side, nice side effect. In other words, how many people have actually found inverses in college algebra? Hopefully some people, nobody. All right, <laughs> this is how you do it. The easiest way to do it is you put the matrix, you put the identity, what do you do to make the identity on the left? The stuff that's on the right will be the inverse function. It just keeps track of it for you. So that's our first technique is don't write the matrices, just do what they do. And do it to the original matrix, do it to the identity, and when you're done, you found your answer. That's a nice thing. Um, it also gives us the ability of, well, what happens if I can't get to the identity? I do all my work, and it's not row equivalent to the identity. Well, if it's not row equivalent to the identity, and I know that row equivalent to the identity is logically the same as it has an inverse, <laughs> that means if it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that. So in the middle of doing all this work, it's like, this is impossible. No inverse. You're done. It's singular. All right, the second thing that we have that's useful is if we go ahead and track, if you track your operations. And so we do things like we have A, so we have AX is equal to B, and we would go through ahead and track, and go ahead and write E1, A, 
x is equal to e1 b, and then we take e2, e1 a x is equal to e2 e1 b. And let's say you know your first part of this is to do Gaussian before Jordan, right? If we do Gauss elimination with a minor modification, let's do Gaussian elimination except let's ignore the need for ones as the lead variable. It's a five, it's a five. Leave it as five, right? Just do arithmetic. It ma sure, it makes your arithmetic harder, but that's perfectly fine. You can do the arithmetic in such a way that you, instead of having ones, you can just leave it as a five. And we only do the Gaussian elimination, and if we do that, so we have whatever you did last, and then you had E2, E1, A, X is equal to E N, and then E2, E1, B, etc. right? It, Gaussian elimination stops, for Gauss, this stops when this is what's called upper triangular, right? It has zeros below the main diagonal, so it's upper triangular. Uh, some terms. Upper triangular means below the diagonal is zeros. Lower triagonal means above the diagonal is zero. And diagonal is only things on the diagonal. Everywhere else is a zero, right? And so some terms. So this is upper triangular when you're done with the Gauss part. And then you would eventually shift on to Jordan, right? But when we're done with the Gauss part, this is upper triangular definition. Upper triangular is some sort of matrix where we have zeros below the diagonal. Lower triangular is we have some values down below. I don't know what they are, but I have zeros above. And then we have the word diagonal, which is values on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. It's not you know, like, for example, the identity, it's a diagonal matrix. Uh, any of the type, sorry, any of the type twos are diagonal matrices. Uh, a type three would be either lower triangular or upper triangular, depending where that thing went. If it's below, it's lower triangular. If it's above, it's upper triangular. Okay. <laughs> so, given those terms, let's let's go back to. I have that En times E2 times E1 times A is what I have, has become U, which is upper triangular. Okay. Could I get A isolated? Sure, I could start saying, I want to get rid of the EN. How would I get rid of the EN? I would multiply by EN's inverse on the left, but I would have to multiply by EN's inverse on the left. And then I would do the one before its inverse, and then the one before its inverse, until we got to E2 inverse, until we got to E1 inverse. In other words, if I bring these to the other side, just so you know, that's not called dividing across. Right? How do you move things? By their inverse. When we say things and think, oh, 3x, I divided by 3. No, you didn't. You moved it by multiplying by its inverse. How do I move things? By multiplying by inverses, by adding inverses. That's how you move it, by causing a do nothing. So if I move this across, 
Each of these will be done in order, but they'll stay on the left side until finally A is going to be equal to E1 inverse, E2 inverse, EN inverse, U. Is everybody okay with that? In terms of the order they came across. And the order they came across was this one first. They came out that direction. Now, if I took an object and broke it up into a multiplication of objects, what do we normally call that? Factoring. So what did I just do to A? I factored it. So that means if I pay attention to the row ops, we actually factor. But what are the factors? Not the op, but the inverse of the op. So we would have to go through here and say, okay, I'm first going to do this row op. Well, on the side, that means A. So you would do this work, all that Gaussian elimination. What would you do first? I'm going to write E1, but I'm going to write E1's inverse. Okay, what would you do next? I'm going to write E2's inverse. What would you do last? I'm going to write EN's inverse. And then what happened? What I'm left with is an upper triangular object. By the way, all of that is A. So A has been factored. Now, so this is some sort of factoring. All right, and you can imagine any multiplication of this is still a factoring. All right, but on the other hand, what also occurs here is if you restrict yourself to type 3 operations, no type 1s, no type 2s, type 3 oper op operations, and only remove values below the diagonal. It's like you have one goal. Take your leads and make zeros below. Don't mess, don't mess with anything on the diagonal. Mess with nothing above the diagonal. Just make things below the diagonal zero. That's your only goal. If that's true, if this is what you restrict yourself to is your process. So if you would look back at any matrix that you have at all like this, if you look at this matrix, you would say, I am only going to do type 3 operations to make that 0, make that 0, make that 0. That's my goal. But what does, when we do that, where will the constants go to make those 0? In that spot, that spot, in that spot. Which means each of those is going to be what? A lower triangular. So if we restrict ourselves to that, they're all type 3, but not only are they type 3, the thing you're messing with is lower triangular, so they stay lower triangular. Okay. So that's a nice little, we look at that now kind of, all right, then what's the point of all that? If we do that, the following happens. E1 inverse, E2 inverse, EN inverse are all lower triangular. And there's another piece of information. And lower triangular times lower triangular is still lower triangular. All right, let's think about what the lower triangular elementary matrix is. It says mess with the element in the lower position. Oh, wait a second. If, my if this was already lower triangular, the only thing it's going to mess with is a lower triangular. Okay, that would mean that everything that you would multiply is lower triangular. And so what's going to happen is A is L U. Where L is lower triangular and it's simply made up of E1 inverse, E2 inverse, up to EN inverse. And 
the upper triangular is U. And so this is called LU factorization. So now I can factor, kind of like factoring numbers. Uh, what are some factors of 12? Just give me any two that you can think of. Two and six, three and four, right? Lots of ways of doing it, right? And I could factor by primes, two, two, three, right? On the other hand, what about matrices? Sometimes we're interested in what's called LU factorization. Turn this into a lower matrix times an upper matrix. Why? Upper triangular matrices have a purpose, back solve. So if you can break it into a lower and an upper, lower and upper have very specific events about them. Half of, essentially half of their values are zero. And we can do things with it. And so this gives me a process of beginning how to, I have a, re, I have a square block of numbers. I can turn this square block of numbers into a lower triangular times an upper triangular. How do I do that? I start off with my matrix. I do Gaussian elimination. I pay attention to what I did until it becomes upper triangular. I take what I did, it becomes L, we're done. That's what those two are. 